What's up guys and welcome back to the Lifting and Rigging channel. My name is Devin and as always we hope that this video finds you and yours well, safe, and just doing the best you can to make it through this crazy time. Today we're joined by John and Greg from Sling Max and then from Mozilla I've got Mike close joining me. So gentlemen, uh, thank you all for joining us today to talk about Sling Max. Thank you Dev. Mike. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us yeah, on. No problem. John or Greg, can you just give us a, a little bit of a brief history about Sling Max overall? Uh, a little bit about what you guys do and why you guys do it. Sure, well, I'll start. I'm John Ketchum. I'm the Vice President of Sling Max Rigging Solutions. I got into the lifting rigging industry about 24 years ago with a small material handling company selling overhead cranes and hoists. And since then, I spent a brief amount of time in the mobile crane industry. I was also a factory rep for Columbus McKinnon. I joined uh, Sling Max team back in 2011 and I oversee all of the Sling Max operations from our corporate headquarters at Aston, Pennsylvania. And then Greg, how did you kind of get involved with uh, Sling Max overall? You know, how did you join the industry and what's your background? I'm the uh, director of engineering for Sling Max and my background is mechanical engineering. I've been in the synthetic fiber rope and sling industry for about 14 years now. I came to Sling Max in 2014 and I've been heading up new product development, R&D, and then overseeing some of the manufacturing as well. See, Slingmax is unique in the rigging industry in that we don't actually manufacture rigging products. We engage in the research and development of specialized rigging products for the heavy lift industry. And in turn, we provide marketing and sales support for these products. So basically we come up with the designs for our entire product line and then we go to market through a manufacturing dealer network. Now we write all of the procedures to fabricate our synthetic sling products and they're all ISO controlled. And all of the dealers, they work from these same procedures. They use the raw materials that are either designed, specified, or produced by us. We even design to build the round sling machines to fabricate the products. And each component that goes into our twin path sling is unique to Sling Max. We have 37 licensed dealers worldwide uh, with 46 authorized fabricating locations in 12 countries. I think everybody who's familiar with Slingmax is familiar with the Twin Path product line. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the engineering in terms of the design, the materials, and the configurations of the Twin Path products? Yeah, Twin Path Sling, it's a high performance round sling. And um, what that means is the core yarns, they're a lot stronger than the traditional nylons and polyesters. Um, it's actually about five times stronger than those fibers uh, for our case spec core yarn. And they also have really low stretch. It stretches more on the order of a steel sling uh, than a typical nylon web sling. The other thing is, it's right in the name, Twin Path. We have the two independent load bearing core paths. That gives it some more resistance to damage. So if you were to say damage one of the paths, the other path is is not affected. Um, so it's it's more resistant to damage in that way. It's an endless configuration, correct? That's right. So you have the Calramax jacket, which is our bulk nylon material, and that's an endless loop. When we manufacture it, we take the K-Spec core yarn and wind it into there. So just depending on how large of a capacity the customer wants, we can put more and more core yarn in there and then make an endless sling of any capacity or length that they want. For somebody who's not familiar or you know might be interested in uh, Twin Path products after listening to this, can you talk about because it is an endless configuration, can you use it in all hitch styles? You can, and I think uh, people sometimes get a little scared of uh, round sling in general when they're looking at it because it's basically a big donut and they don't know <laughs> what to do with it, you know? Yeah. It's, it's easy enough to figure in a straight line pull, but yeah, uh, you can definitely use choke hitch, basket, double wraps, so all configurations, but it does sometimes uh, put people off when they're when they first get their hands on it. I've seen them commonly hanging off of like a spreader bar or a spreader beam on construction sites and things like that. Or if it's in a mill, hanging off of some type of a custom below the hook device that's being used. A lot of people that are in the lifting and rigging industry are most familiar with, you mentioned, you know, like the synthetic web slings, alloy chain, wire rope. So what what are some of the major differences between a uh, twin path sling and some of the more common slings that people are using on job sites or in industrial environments? For a start, when comparing twin path slings to wire rope or chain slings, 
the weight difference is significant. Our synthetic slings are as strong as steel, but at about 90% less weight. And that's huge when you're talking about rigging because even when developing rigging plants, everything below the crane hook is considered low. So if your rigging is extremely heavy, then it reduces what you can actually lift with the crane. And this weight savings also creates an ergonomic benefit. Being so much lighter than steel slings, twin path slings take much less manpower or equipment to move them around and into place. And when you compare them to uh, twin path slings to nylon or polyester web slings, there's also some distinct advantages there. Uh, web slings are also very light, but they're also limited in capacity. We catalog our twin path slings uh, in capacities up to 400 tons at a five to one design factor, and we can fabricate to, to even higher capacities on request. There's also the fact that both nylon and polyester web slings stretch. At load, nylon slings can elongate anywhere between eight and 10%, and polyester slings it up to about 3%. If you're using multiple web slings during the lift, this can create an unequal loading and could cause the load to possibly maybe bounce during movement, which could possibly overload the rigging. And another consideration when we're talking about stretch is when you're working with tight headroom restrictions, for web slings, you have to factor in that elongation. And twin path slings, we have less than 1% elongation at working load limit, which is the same as wire rope. And round slings are really the only rigging whose load-bearing components are not exposed. You know, the core yarns of a round sling are encased in a cover for protection. Mm -hmm. Wire rope, chain, web, and to an extent, high-performance fiber rope slings all have their load-bearing components exposed and in direct contact with the load. Do you guys have any issue instilling rigor confidence with, you know, if, if they're picking between like a wire rope lifting sling or they see an alloy chain lifting sling and then they see like a, a synthetic web sling or like a twin path, do you have issues with people kind of being concerned about, well, you know, I'm looking at chain and I know chain is pretty solid. I know that wire rope is pretty solid, but then I don't, I'm not comfortable trying to do this giant pick with this, you know, twin path just because it looks so soft, it looks so malleable. Yeah, absolutely. There's still a lot of feeling that synthetics are new or unproven. We get that all the time. But really, you know, they really introduced nylon for slings and ropes back in World War II. The high performance fibers, they're newer, but they've still been around for about 30 years now. Twin pass slings, we've had them on the market since the early 90s. So we have almost a 30 year track record of safe use by now. So really does it come down to just proper understanding and training of the equipment? You know, this is when you should use it. This is when you shouldn't use it. This is where it has no business being used. Absolutely. Um, it, it's training and getting them used to it. And I think that there's a lot of maybe false sense of security with some of the what's called traditional rigging like wire rope and chain a lot of times a lot of thought is given into cut protection for synthetic slings and for good reason but we also see a lot of wire rope slings used with no cut protection whatsoever and we actually did some testing at Sling Max on our test bed where we took um, different kinds of rigging and rigged it right over a steel block with a sharp nine degree edge, which is way worse than you'd ever really see in the field. But the twin pass sling and the wire rope slings actually broke around the same load um, when we did that, which was a surprise to us. We thought it was gonna be um, a lot different result, um, but they were actually really close. And then when we, um, protected it with our corner max sleeve. The uh, twin path far outperformed the steel sling, even with protection on the steel sling also. So I think there's a lot of, like I said, false sense of security that people think, oh, I can put this uh, steel wire rope around a sharp edge and it's no big deal. And maybe they've gotten lucky so far, but it's not as safe as they think. I think there's a big misconception too about what actually an edge is and that it has to be sharp for it to cut. What type of protection do you guys have in regards to abrasion resistance and cut resistance? For abrasion resistance, we could custom fabricate what we call a sin arm pad, uh, which is typically made out of the same cover max cover material and we put a felt liner in it and uh, we can attach it to the sling either permanently or, or make it removable. Uh, for cut protection, we offer two products that are actually engineered cut protection, um, Coramax sleeve and the Coramax pad. Coramax pads are designed to be used on 90 degree angles and the Coramax sleeve could be used on any uh, rounded or, or, or any type of edge. And I think that's that's important. Uh, you know, you mentioned rounded edge. I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand what an edge is when you've got a sling that's around a load. Are there any applications or anything you guys have seen where 
a sling is kind of broke unexpectedly because it wasn't properly protected. It's always an issue because anything, even a chamfered edge, should require some type of protection, you know, and, and quite often people don't tend to see it that way. The Web Sling Tie Down Association uh, was, I think, the first really to publish some information on edges in their high performance round sling standard, which I think is good information. They uh, put some a different type of radii that you can uh, you can use with an unprotected round sling, and they're, they're very small when you really get down to it. What are other common misconceptions when it comes to using a twin path uh, round sling or using something else? The biggest misconception is that it's more difficult to rig with. You know, people think that just because they can drag their steel slings through the mud and, and things like that, they don't have to worry about taking care of a sling. But for one thing, the, the synthetics are a lot tougher than people think. And I think that they're treating their steel slings a lot worse and damaging them a lot more than they think. So, you know, you, you'll see steel slings uh, with kinks and rust and, and everything else. And people don't think twice about it because, you know, they've been around forever and that's how they've always treated them. And then you'll have a synthetic sling, which, yeah, you have to take care of it and you have to make sure that it's, it's protected, but it's not as fragile as some of these guys who are used to the other stuff think. And so we were talking a little bit about your, like the cover protection on the sling overall. We were kind of talking about edge protection. Are there other features and technologies that you guys are building into these twin path slings just to help make sure that people are rigging, you know, safely or, you know, to, to do best practices if they are up against an edge or some kind of unique pick? We also have an, an overload uh, device on our slings called the Check Fast Inspection System, unique to Sling Max and Twin Path. And uh, it actually acts as not only an overload device, but it's also an internal detector. It's a working core fiber within the sling. It sees all the same load, all the same UV and all the other possible damage. There's an external warning indicator that protrudes from the cover of the sling. If there's internal damage or if the sling is suddenly overloaded, that retracts beneath the cover. The rigger then knows to take it out of service and send it back in for inspection or repair. The most recent version of the B39 standard, one of the major additions to that was a uh, chapter dedicated specifically to the high performance round sling. So obviously, you know, Twin Path and other high performance round sling type products are becoming um, more prevalent in the market enough that, you know, there there's actually part of that standard now in addition to wire rope and alloy chain and regular round slings. What type of applications have you seen Twin Paths use that might surprise people? A few years ago, we, we developed a synthetic boom pendant, boom line pendant for cranes, and we used twin path slings in place of rope. That was, that was pretty unique, we thought. Uh, we actually partnered with a hardware manufacturer who developed specific fittings for that application. And the pendants did have that check fast inspection system installed so they could be inspected for overload. And because of the weight savings, they were able to easily be removed for inspection and storage. Uh -huh. We had another unique uh, application, which uh, twin pass slings are going to be used as restraints for a, a nuclear fuel cask. So now here, the design calls for the canisters to be tethered to the, the wall of a, basically a concrete storage bunker. And this bunker is designed to be able to withstand a natural disaster, such as a hurricane or tornado, or even a man-made disaster, such as like a missile impact, right? Wow. Yeah, so uh, the system would involve a special turnbuckle to tighten the twin pass sling around the canister, anchor it to the wall, but the sling has to be designed to absorb the impact without failure. And I would, I would never have envisioned our slings uh, ever being used or even considered for this type of application. For our industry, we talk about fit a lot. You know, there are times where there are just some lifting slings that just don't work in certain applications. So when you're thinking about good fit versus bad fit, are there, you know, different applications that you can think of specifically where a sling max twin path just isn't going to work? It's not going to be the best, 
you know, option for that specific pick. I think when you get to really high temperatures, that's when you have to move away from a, a synthetic and it's not going to be the best application for a twin pass sling. So a regular twin pass sling, we say it should be used at a maximum of 180 degrees Fahrenheit um, temperature. Um, you can get higher than that. We also have uh, another product called a spark eater sling. Um, that core fiber is called uh, Technora. It's an aramid fiber. Um, aramid fibers, most people know Kevlar, um, but there's a few different fibers in that, in that same family. Um, those are all a lot um, higher resistant to, to temperature compared to some of the other synthetic fibers. Um, those slings you can use up to 300 degrees Fahrenheit, but if you get to really crazy high temperatures like a steel mill or something like that, then you really just have to move back to something like a chain slang um, in those applications. I've seen TwinPath used a lot on construction sites, whether you know they're coming off of a spreader bar or they're just you know coming right off the crane hook in a single or a multi-lay configuration. But why do you think twin paths are becoming more popular compared to a traditional sling assembly like a wire rope sling, which, you know, you go by any job site, you usually see wire rope hanging off the crane hook. But more and more, you know, I'm seeing twin paths. Why do you think that is? I think the biggest thing is weight. I mean, you talk to the the users out in the field and even sometimes when they have a difficult um, application where they need us to help them, they'll tell us, we don't want to go back to steel. It's too heavy. It's too cumbersome. We'll figure out a way to use twin path. Um, the, the guys in the field, they just, they just don't like using uh, steel if they can avoid it, especially on the larger lifts. And that's the other thing is lifts are getting much, much larger. Um, so much construction has gone to modular uh, precast things, um, pieces. So instead of building a bridge, you know, out of beams right there, a lot of the stuff is coming in in large sections. So the lifts are getting bigger and the slings are getting bigger. And it just makes it that much more uh, important to have rigging that's light. Yeah, and you increase capacity with a chain sling, and that's going to feel a heck of a lot heavier than if you're increasing capacity on a twin path. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's the difference between, yeah, throwing a, you know, you can throw a, a twin path sling with a half a million pound working load limit over your shoulder and carry it onto the job site. Um, if you were to do that with a, a steel sling, you have to put it in a truck and have a forklift to get it out. Um, you're just not going to pick it up like that. You have to hire the rock just to work that one chain specifically. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> Can we talk about repairability of your slings? Because like with alloy chain, that's like a big feature. You know, if you have one link that gets damaged, you can either, depending if it's mechanical or not, you can just either chop it out and replace it or just replace that entire leg. Now with twin path, uh, what's the repairability of that? If it gets damaged, do you have to just discard it because it is a synthetic or what What can be repaired on this to keep it in service? Pretty much, if, if uh, as long as a core yarn is not damaged, then the sling can be repaired. So uh, again, the core yarn is, is it's covered by ASME B30.9, Web Sling Tie Down, and, and Corage Institute. But, uh, but the, we divide the two paths on the twin path to actually make it repairable. So we're able to put a patch over a section and then put it back in the field. We recertify everyone to uh, to a proof load. For riggers or for inspectors, what's the best way for them to get a good understanding of the, the makeup and design of this twin path sling so they know that they are you know inspecting it properly and knowing what to do uh, when to pull it out of service when to keep it in the service we do have guides we have a twin path user manual that covers uh, all of the use and inspection of the sling so we, we make it very easy the other thing to consider too is you know if you look at other synthetic fiber slings like uh, say a synthetic rope sling um, those the the core yarn is the entire sling so all the wear you're seeing on the outside is taken away from the um, load capacity of the sling. On the twin path, you're only wearing away the jacket and the jacket's just there to uh, protect the core yarn. So we have the double layer jacket where it's green on the outside and red on the inside. So as soon as you see red on the inside, you send it back to your uh, local Sling Max dealer and they can put a patch over it. You haven't actually touched the core yarn at all that actually lifts the load and you go right back out there and you're, you're, you're good as new. And so if they're awesome. on the field and they, they see, you know, a, a bunch of patches on these twin paths, it doesn't mean that there's any loss of capacity. It doesn't mean they're any less strong than they were. It just means that it hasn't been repaired and is still safe to keep in service. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. I mean, you look at something like a, a nylon or a polyester web sling, 
those are pretty much just treated as commodities. They're fairly inexpensive. You know, they use them and you, you get a, a nick in it or you get a cut in it or it starts to tear or wear and people just throw them away and buy a new one. But it's a lot more cost effective to have something that's got that added protection as well as the repairability that, you know, you the benefit that you would get from like a chain sling, like Devin said. Good point, Mike. I mean, and the same goes for wire. I mean, it's it's very easy to, uh, to kink a wire rope. You know, if you're using it over a very small diameter uh, shackle or, or wrapped around an edge, and then immediately it has to be discarded. You know, you can't, you can't repair the wire. And so earlier we were kind of talking about fit and we were talking about if it's high uh, heat environments, those aren't really as, as good for these synthetic products. Now, as far as like industries that you can support, you know, for maritime applications, we were talking about construction. Where do you guys see these slings? Where are they working, you know, great in the field to help save the, you know, the backs of the riggers in the field? Construction is huge, like you said. Power industry, whether it's uh, generation or transmission distribution, we're starting to see the wind industry uh, use them for, uh, installations. Pretty extensive use in offshore oil and gas as well. They're not affected by water, whether it be seawater or regular water, so they can be submerged for extended periods of time, uh, which also is a benefit on some construction sites when you put you know, pilings in for, for bridges and such like that. Even the manufacturing industry, you know, the usually the lifts aren't as large, but places like automotive manufacturing where they lift dies, um, you know, maybe dozens of times a day, and then um, they really just wear out uh, steel slings due to fatigue. And we have uh, twin pass slings in there that will last tens of thousands of, of lifts. And even though it's not a really big lift, they like them just because they're so long lasting. I love doing these deep dives like this because it's rare that we get to actually talk to you guys as the vendor and have you talk about, you know, what the makeup design is and what the best use cases are. Because we can we can talk about these products all day, but at the end of the day, this is something that we, you know, we learn from you guys and then we try to make sure that we're manufacturing the, the best products we can up to the, stand, the ISO standards that you guys set so that the people in the field are getting exactly what they want to do exactly what they need it to do. And then they're using those best practices to, to rig them safely and have very successful picks. Where can people go if they want to get more information about uh, Sling Max? and the Twin Path product line. All of our most current information is on our website, which is slingmax.com. You can also check us out on Facebook, LinkedIn, and uh, Instagram. So we'll have some links for you guys up top that you can click on to go learn more about Slingmax, to learn more about you know what this whole process is so you guys can be more informed. As always, we thank you so much for joining us today on the Lifting and Rigging channel, and we hope we we'll see you next time. Thanks. <laughs>